I was in stuff. I'm sorry. This was like when I was coming home from school, because I, I guess it was kind of late. It was around eight, because I had stayed late that day. And I was the project, and I was walking down the street, and then the police car uh, pulled up, and they uh, asked if they could ask a couple of questions. And they were asking me questions so like, "What is my name? How old I am?" Uh, apparently, there was a murder in the neighborhood, but I haven't heard about it. Sorry. And then they were asking like, "Do you know the boy where you were walking?" And they were asking questions like, "Who do you run with?" and stuff like that. And then um, the police officer who had stopped me had blue smoke in my face, and they just drove off. I have never had any kind of police, but everybody around me has. Yeah, my uncle over at my, my grandma's house, where she lives now, she lives on 90, 93rd in Evans. And literally right, right outside of the house, my uncle, he kind of tall, and he likes skin, he got afro, he don't look like, he don't have dread. So sad, but they was riding past, and they stopped him. They made, made him take off all his stuff. Threw his stuff all on the curb. Um, they they asked him. I think they asked him where was he going, and he's literally right in front of the house. He was coming out of his car, and they asked him did he steal the car. They ran his license plate, didn't find nothing, and they basically basically kind of beat him up for no reason at all. And he's right in front of his house. And as he's telling them that that's his house, they don't care. They just still they put him in the back of the police car. We, the whole time, we sitting in the house and we looking out the window, the entire time. And they basically put him in, in the back of the car, uh, ran him through, and then let him go. I got stopped, like, with my friends or whatever. But we was kind of out, like, at nine, something like that. We was coming home from, you know, playing the game. Coming from my house, playing the game. So we we had just thought about police like what you are doing or whatever at this time and I got the corner so they can go home and then they had uh got in trouble so they were other friend they ain't they ain't had nothing they were needed. So they told us to stand on the car or whatever. They had us out there for a minute and you know, I asked them like why you got us out here and tell me to shut up? And I asked him again. Then he had slapped me or whatever. And you know. But I asked him want to be a, a detective. So, I mean, I don't let that get to me. Wow. I felt kind of disrespected. And like at the same time, I felt like they were treating me as if I was already a criminal without even knowing me at all. Well, it made me feel kind of like um, distant from the police because, like I said, he was just sitting in front of his car. He was, he was literally coming from somewhere. He parked, he got out, and he sat there. He had his door open, and he was just sitting there. Police pulled up, pulled him out of the car, started investigating or whatever. So called investigating, and I'm just sitting there like, he didn't do nothing. We all waited for him to come to the house. So. I felt like. Like, man, I'm a man, and another man just slapped me. I can't do nothing about it, you know. It's just the law, I guess. So I was just, I just, I felt, I was embarrassed. You know, I ain't wanna, like, I ain't wanna have no encounters with the police, like, nothing. Like, I didn't even wanna look at them. And I just went home, told my mom, like, and she like, that's it, what people with. Uh, they got some issues going on, whatever. So it took me a while to get over it, but, it was a mix of surprise and anger. Cause I've like heard stories about how the police were like disrespectful and stuff like that, but I never really believed it. Cause I thought the police were like were supposed to protect you and like, you know, uphold order and stuff like that. And then like after I was stopped, it's just like maybe these stories are true. I have no idea what they could be capable of if they could like be that disrespectful as soon as I'm criminal. And I'm just one boy walking down the street. So I don't know how they would have responded if I was in a large group or had responded in a disrespectful way when he blew smoke in my face. It just kind of made me feel like I don't trust him. <laughs> just to just see your uncle being thrown across 
Before the incident, I probably would have instantly went to the police for help, but like, after the incident, I don't know if they'll come, if they're responsible, will they like come at me for being involved in the incident? Because it's like, if they, if they're the kind of people that are gonna assume who I am, then they assume that I started the altercation or something like that. It simply changed at that moment. My uncle doesn't look like any type of criminal at all. Like, So, uh, you know, he was encouraging me to, you know, do criminal justice or go to the Navy or whatever. So it was like, like, now all police is bad people, you know. I mean, you just got to let stuff go. It's just like other people on the street, like, you got your good people, you got your bad people. So that's how it is. Yeah, because, like, at first it was like, I assume that all cops or good cops, but now I realize that there are some bad cops who when I call them, what's going to come? A good cop or a bad cop? Will it always be effective, do their job, ask questions, investigate, or criminalize and penalize me before I even know? So please join me in welcoming to the podium for this conversation, our panel, which includes Margaret Beale Spencer, who is the Marshall Field IV Professor of Urban Education here at the University of Chicago, Emily Buss, the Mark and Barbara Free Professor of Law here at the University of Chicago Law School, Michelle Conyers, a clinical professor of law at the University of Chicago Law School, Carla Shedd, Assistant Professor of Sociology at Columbia University, and Jamel Triggs, who's a youth mentor and instructor at Blackstone Bicycle Work with the Experimental Station. Please join me in welcoming all of them to the there, There's so much to pick up on from the first conversation and that video. I've, um, and I think there's a lot that we want to get to here. But let me actually start, if I can, with you, Rochelle, by going back two years, perhaps almost to the day here, when you had a similar conference, the title of which was Living Life for Bulletproof, Public Health Crisis of Youth Trauma and Violence. How did these kinds of encounters that we've been hearing about today contribute to that broader theme that you talked about here two years ago? Well, I think the direct connect is traumatic and it's violent. It's low-level violence, but it permeates an entire so, in my mind, this is all. Well, I'm going to. I mean, I'm Thank you. Better? Yeah, in my mind, it's all of the piece, okay? Because you've got 15 year olds who are scared of the police. And I need to break the police. You've got 15 year olds who are scared of the police. Okay? I don't want to get stopped by the police on Chicago's outside. I park out of mine so much. Hey, the street is not true. That's my belief, and I would say, okay, I'm going to let out you know, anything except that's my reality. Yeah, yeah. And, and Carla, you have a book that you're working on that will be coming out this fall. The title of that book is Unequal City, Race, Schools, and Perceptions of Injustice. Um, and one of the things you focus on is the racially stratified social and physical terrain as you described it, that you've traversed between home and school. Two institutions here, school, but the criminal justice system. Um, as you think about that terrain and what we've experienced and heard from youth today, what are the long-term impacts of the kind of experiences that we've just witnessed? Well, these um, videos show that there are experiences that young people are having that are marking them. It's a developmental question. It's a developmental issue. Um, this is a formative stage of their lives. Number one, they're figuring out who they are. So in terms of identity, how do you present yourself to the public? How does the public receive you? You've heard the young woman, the young girl say, I don't want to make them more adults than they've already been made by the police. But you heard her say, you know, he didn't look like a criminal. So what does that mean in terms of how you wear your hair, how you wear your clothes, how you present? And we've heard of the other strategies. So 
This is a coming of age issue, and as of all other transitions, whether you're going into adulthood or starting a job or maybe starting a family or going to school, this is a true marker of what your life trajectory will look like. And if it starts on this phase being so negative and so traumatic, um, we have a problem. And I think that's part of the social terrain young people are navigating. But for my book, I also think about the physical terrain they have to navigate as they're going to school and they're making these calculations, as we've heard. Young people I talk to, they figure out which streets they're going to go in, as they said, how many people they may walk with, what is protective. So they're being adaptive to this world, and no one else is thinking of this as normal, but it is their normal. So I can say my book definitely corroborates all that you've heard here from studying young people um, who attend Chicago public schools, ninth and 10th graders, they're at the start of this adultification, having these very adult-like experiences at an age where they're still young. They should still be children. They should be teenagers willing and able to try out any number of identities, any number of things that they should do, but they're very much constrained. And there are different ways that they adapt to these constraints. I want to invite everybody here to feel free to jump in, but Margaret, this is a perfect pivot to you and your research that really looks at um, youth human development, looks at the adolescent mind. Um, what are the impacts there? It's like a, a very, uh, I'll make sure your microphone's on too. In fact, I'll ask all the panelists just to check your. Thank you. Oh, you didn't give one. Oh. Can we oh. get JT a uh, microphone? Uh, I want to continue with that point, which is so important, and that is. As a developmental psychologist and a person who has focused on these issues for a, a long time and applied them in real time, what I can say, especially given the previous panel that has uh, basically been noted by you as well, is that you know development occurs in context, in everyday context. And for me, that introduces a really basic concern, and that is number one, the problem of adultification. And two, the other issue of dehumanization. And for the, uh, for the young Tatiana on the last panel, when she made the comment that it feels like being black at the wrong time, you know, that almost made me cry. I was so moved by it. For a young person to have to go there, to think about who she is, and what I want to say about that, so you have to allow me a couple of minutes because it is a nuanced story, a, a, a complex human development story under irregular conditions that have been socially constructed. It means then that our children have to think about very in nuanced ways about very basic everyday issues, navigating space, and adolescents in particular, you know, getting from home to school dealing with peer groups, et cetera, in an environment when their humanity, their very humanity is not recognized. As you said, being black at the wrong time, that means before I open my mouth and share how smart, how thoughtful, et cetera, that I am, she's viewed first as a person of color and a society at the time. When we, when we want to de-emphasize, not acknowledge, the fact that race continues to matter, so we have adolescents who are charged with the same task, tasks as adolescents in the suburbs and other more privileged communities, and that is to prepare oneself for adulthood by learning how to work, and you do that by making, by having work opportunities, and being able to make mistakes without consequences, and you learn from that feedback, being able to navigate space uh, under safe conditions, and, not have, and, and, and coping with all of that in very nuanced ways, but they don't have the opportunity to use those sort of nuanced ways of thinking when they get to school. So we have people, yes, who are making careers tallying other people's misery, and that's not good enough. So we have you know, basic funding uh, going to people who, again, enumerate how bad things are. So that's the what, for me, of the calculus. But we don't want to stop and understand the more nuanced issue of the how and the why of it, and how all of us are a part of that. And yes, you're absolutely right, sir. You know, this is an economic issue. That failure for some 
guarantee success for us. And we don't acknowledge that, but yet our young people understand that. So when you think about the data, we have the data. Uh, and the data suggests that even with all these challenges, that our children are able to show a great deal of resiliency. That in the face of all these challenges, they're still able to do well psychologically. Let's face it, the suicide statistics are very different for white children, adolescents, and for black children. Somehow they're managing to show resiliency, but the issue is the cost. So therefore, in schools, when you think about the psychic energy that it takes to maintain self-esteem, to maintain psychological well-being, to just to navigate space in under-resourced, under-supported conditions, using all that psychic energy for those tasks, well, how in the heck is there anything left to maximize out of the standardized test that is a part that become a part of everyday lives in school for our children? So that's all I'm saying is that there is a mismatch between the normal human development contextual experiences of kids of color and other kids, but yet they're all being uh, school, they're all being compared on the same rubric. So they're all being compared in terms of achievement outcomes, but no one's asking the question of the everyday experiences. Let me give you one example of how that can change. Because uh, basically everyone's being trained, teachers, you know, social workers, police officers, to not recognize that their training and their learning is simply a part of this demonization, if you will, of set of beliefs about people of color. So how, but you can, but you can, you can grow and develop and show resiliency in your professional role. So for example, one of the professional activities I take part in is I apply the science to, in communities, is I attend and I'm a part of groups, and one is the att attending meetings that give me talks at the International Association of Chiefs of Police, so you get a sense of what's happening around the com country and how some police chiefs get it. And they understand to get it means then that their, uh, their staff members are more competent and do a better job, therefore resources are spent more smartly if they understand the challenges that they need to overcome. So in one uh, district on the West Coast, there's a police chief who understands that there needs to be a, a new way of thinking about youth, relationally speaking, right? And you can only do that by getting up close. And so what he does is to give his police officers a couple of hours a week paid. And what they do is to mentor neighborhood youngsters. So what he finds is that in the afternoons, if you attend, you go to precincts in uh, his uh, police district, you find young people hanging around in uh, precincts. They're not hanging around because they've been you know, taken off the street, but they're, they're there to see their mentors. They're there to get help with their, with their homework, et cetera. And you know what? It means that when you see this child of color on a dark corner, you're going to think first before you pull the trigger because suddenly they're humans, okay? And they're not just you know, people of color who have been dehumanized and also disrespected. And it makes a difference for relationships. So therefore, youngsters understand that how they cope might be difficult for police officers. So there's a reciprocal benefit. We can change. Well, let's let's stay with that idea of change for a second. JT, I want to come to you. Everyone else, um, I want to get your thoughts and everyone here with us. Um, let, let's, let's envision a different kind of encounter than what we've heard expressed in the videos and today. Um, what would that look like? A different type of encounter between uh, the a perspective you, of a police officer to the person? Absolutely. The person? Yeah, to a young person for it. From your perspective. Okay, from, from my perspective, uh, a, a, a good policing interaction would be basically a police officer would, would interact with the child, juvenile, or person as if they were a human being. Uh, the, the, the initial reaction that I have when I see a police officer is not to, to, uh, to, to interact with is, is the day, it, it feels like it's going to be conflict though, instead of an interaction. Uh, interactions happen. Interactions are can sometimes be good, but conflicts are always, are always bad. It, you, you can't have any conflict. Uh, a conflict can either go wrong or right with the police officer. But uh, back to your question, uh, uh, a good interaction would be uh, a mentor police officer coming up to a young black male that he sees on the corner waiting for a bus just to see what he, if you want to see what he's doing, if you want to see why he's standing there, talk to him. Uh, 
talks about. It's that simple. It's not a where you're going, what you're doing. It's what's going on with you, you know? How was your day today? Mm. Anything crazy happened? Uh, I talk to my kids on a daily basis about this. When they come into my shop and they, and they interact with me, I'm the mentor. So the first thing they do is interact with me. And the first thing I ask them is, how was your day? How was school? Anything crazy happen? And they're, they're, they're flat out, the first thing they're saying is telling me every single thing that happened. Mm -hmm. Everything that happened to them to the time they woke up to the time they saw me. And then it, it becomes, it, it's a different type of relationship. Before, before that, I was on a different type of relationship with children at the shop. It was strictly, I was just a production mechanic, and the kids, were, and, and I got hired from the kids, so me being a production mechanic, I pretty much just did bicycle work and didn't interact with them, and they were a nuisance, and I didn't like them. <laughs> <laughs> so I became a mentor, I actually saw that they might be a nuisance, but these are future generations. They're, they're the next ones that's going to have to take the reins of this earth. Do, do, do things better than we did. And without that mentorship, or without that, that police officer stepping up and being that mentor, these things will never happen because you're just going to keep coming back full forward. So that's a good interaction. I, I find it interesting that you, with the change in your title, sort of changed your orientation to them. And the conversation earlier, we, um, a few of the students said, you know, the officer has a badge figure of authority, as uh, Forrest said, this is a representative of the state, and how might we think of that position as a way of being more on the nurturing arm, the we call the sociologist who talks about the meshing of the punishing arm of the state to the nurturing arm. What would be the nurturing arm? Would it be our public schools? Would it be public health provision? Would it be the juvenile justice system? And I'm studying that now in New York, and we see more punishment sometimes than nurturing. But to think about having these positions and then having a different orientation to who you encounter. And so for me, it's important to think of the people who are the brokers in taking kids on a trajectory towards success are perhaps a different direction. Police officers are brokers. Social workers are brokers. Teachers are brokers. Mentors are brokers. Parents, professional parents especially, are brokers. And so how do each of these people either um, accumulate advantages in the investments they're making into the young people, or does it re represent a cumulative disadvantage if they're negative encounters? And so it's really interesting to think about how we can think of these interactions and shift them in a different way. Iris, since you chime in, we should get comments from you all because we're agreeing too much. <laughs> and, and I want to make sure your microphone is on. Oh, I'm like, you just double check that. It's on. Okay, all right. It's just not wondering how about this. Is it better? Yes. Yeah. Oh, my lot was um, Okay. Uh, what I just wanted to add to, I mean, I think this, I, I very much share this idea. I do think there's a role for the juvenile justice system to the extent that's where young people are. A lot of young people shouldn't be there, but wherever they are. And I think that gets to the, to the point of the shift your shift was just realizing that in your role as an expert bike mechanic, you could also play an extremely important role as one of the many people who is engaged in the upbringing of young people. And I, I, I want to push a little back on the sort of the, the worry about adultification in one way, so a little bit of disagreement, which is just that a very important part, aspect of adolescence is that it is transitional. And one of the most important things that I don't think is inconsistent with what anybody has said is we have to take young people very seriously and in all those engagements treat them seriously as the adults they're becoming. And I think sometimes the risk of focusing, and I don't think this is a risk for the way people here who are really thinking about this issue focus, but sometimes the rhetoric is kind of, it's either these are children, these are kids, or, you know, right? Uh, these are criminals, these are adults. So, well, there's, there's this really important developmental stage where the young people very much see themselves as the adults are becoming. And if we think about being a parent or a teen, I can, I can say the special challenge. I mean, professional parent is really a great, I like the term because it shouldn't apply just to parents, it should apply to everybody in every walk of life that's engaged in these young people. How are we actually helping with that upbringing in the roles that we play? And I think from the first panel, um, Professor Stewart, is that you get your name right? Yes. Uh, made the point that we're always teaching, we're always training. But the other piece that I want to pick up on that I think is very much tied with what you said is we're always in relationships. They're either good or bad. And young people are not just learning how to behave 
and how to see themselves, but with whom are they, who cares about me? Where am I connected? And every engagement with the police that is a negative interaction is a message that my relationship with you is in conflict. My relationship to the community of law enforcement is as outsider, as alien, as in opposition to. You see me this way, and as I learn who I am as I grow up, I begin to see myself that way. Right. So the real interest is in every police encounter, how is the message? We are one community of lawmakers and law enforcers, and we are living in this community together, and I am helping you as you grow up to understand someone I take very seriously and understand what it means to be a citizen in that society. Martin. Yeah, I got a few. Yeah, cool. um, Actually, go ahead, Michelle, and I'll go to Mark. I, I was just going to disagree a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. I really think we've got to be very careful and that this adultification is critical because it's the first step to somehow making children of color forfeit child care. I, I, yeah, I, I don't disagree with any of that. So that's that's the point. Let me finish my point. And yes, I still have scars from raising a teenage son. So I, I, I feel your pain. But the fact of the matter is, as they are becoming adults, and we must take them seriously, but we must also not take them seriously. They're knuckleheads. I'm sorry. That's a special scientific term. <laughs> you know? They think they're grown, and what we must remember at the street corner, at the police station, or wherever else we are, we are the adults in the room. This is not a balanced test. It's not. It is not the youth and the police. That is a ridiculous dichotomy for me. Where are all the other adults who are supposed to be responsible? Youth and police can never be balanced. And to say that they share an equal weightiness, no, they don't. It is about the metric. It is about looking at the kid and saying, you're a pain in the neck, you're a nuisance, but you're a 15-year-old nuisance. And with my help, when you get to be 25, you're going to be sitting on a panel talking about helping some other little knucklehead. <laughs> That's what community is about to do. So, and we so often give up earlier on young, on children of color, but black and brown boys, the problem is that what we see, they fit the description. Yeah. For people to say, my relatives don't look like criminals, says we all agree what a criminal looks like. And that's about a black boy between the ages of 15 and 19 with some weird hairstyle uh, and some baggy bags. And so we all have to change lots of things, and I would congratulate everyone on the panel for saying it. Her hair is not felonious. My hair is not felonious. Her hair has not committed a crime. We we, we don't work on that. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's not criminal. It's not. Um, so what are you looking at when you're looking at a 15 year old? Well, and, That's and, my only pushback. Go, yes. I push back, and I think I was agreed to push back. I want to push back and push back. First of all, I very much agree with that, everything you said. But I, I think it's, I think there, there's, there's different categories here, right? One is about <coughs> level of respect. And I actually think all young people, as in their adolescence, as they grow toward adulthood, need to get a message, a very strong message, that even though they're knuckleheads, maybe they're, it's, it, it really matters what they think, it matters uh, what they are becoming, and that is that is about a message of not just you're still a kid, but you're becoming something else. I think mean, it's very important. And I actually think we also, for change, are black and black and brown on that dimension. And so, I mean, I would say this is this kind of idea of taking seriously and respecting, and in that sense, looking forward to the adults everybody's becoming something that's, that I think is also for a change. Uh, but the other thing I have to say is, very quickly, I, I taught a, um, a high school course on juvenile justice at the law school. A high school course brought together 
uh, two groups of young people who came from very different backgrounds and very different schools, both associated with the University of Chicago. And you did this very recently. I just did it in the winter. It's sort of a little bit still ongoing, a little bit of it left, but they, the, the, the course is over. Um, and one of those groups of kids were from the laboratory schools. Laboratory schools, it's you know, a lot of quite affluent young people at that school, and a lot of faculty kids go to school. It's a you know, it's been around forever, it's kind of been a long uh, recognized institution. The other was the Woodlawn Burner School, which is um, a, a very new school, a school that is um, at uh, 64th University, it's a local school, um, and is, has shown real success and commitment to provide a very high quality education on the limited means that are available uh, in, the public, in the public charter system. And I wanted, among other things, for young people to be talking to each other. Not just having adults with opinions about things, but let's let's talk about the, these issues, and, and I want you to be talking to each other as well. And I want to learn from that, um, and I learned a lot from that. But one of the things that I think brings ties to the, to the point that you and I were going back and forth a little bit about is that there was a discussion that sort of erupted at the end of one of the classes between uh, the two groups of students describing what happened when there had been an incident involving drugs in the two schools. Each had had incidents involving drugs in the schools. Or, you know, Someone was, was caught with uh, drugs in the school. And clearly the reaction at the laboratory school had been to protect the kids, right? They were knuckleheads. They needed to have this not ruin their lives. And what really mattered is they have a chance to go on to college and grow up and get some sense. And the reaction of the little one kids is, you know, was, was sort of floored by that. To sort of be sort of thinking, well, that's a, you know, that's a, a violation of the law. How is it okay to protect these kids, right? So it was very interesting to see that in the context of the, the, the Blue Bond experience, there was, a real, there was a real value placed on that law and order that was not, I think, recognizing the, the risks they were sort of, that that, that, that were sort of putting, putting their community at in, in, in that context, right? So I think that goes to what you're saying. It's yes. Doing this to protect young people from their mistakes and the importance of doing that, right? So that's the way it makes sense for young people listening. Yeah. Okay, can I make a quick comment real quick? Sorry. She told me to get on the mic and I wanted to say something. Sorry. I was standing here for a minute, so my comment is kind of old. I want to go back on the good police interaction. I seen it one time in St. Louis with an old white man. So this guy was actually crazy. Like he was yelling and cursing at the police, and the police had a handcuff. They put my mic down. I'm not going to leave it. They had him handcuffed to a cell, and the, the guy was like, the police had had out, he taken the police had out with his head. And guess what? The police did their job. Their job is to be orderly. Their job is to get criminals, so they train them how to run and catch you. They train them how to deal with people that are acting unlawful. So it's not unnatural for them to find somebody that's not cooperating. So what they did was, Two officers helped them. They stayed calm and they kept like telling him, "Like, sir, you got to calm down. Sir, you got to calm down." And I was so amazed. I was like, "So y'all do know how to be police officers? Like, y'all do know how to do this? Like, I thought they were gonna flip this man, knock him down. The guy was like, literally, like, let me fucking see, like, the police officers and everything. And I couldn't believe it. But they, they, they stood their ground." They say with their uniform, the uniform is you take yourself outside your person, of course a regular person will get that, but your uniform is you're supposed to go by these bylaws. If somebody runs, chase them. If they out of order, you know how to hold them a certain way. You know how to pin them down, you know how to tie them up. That's a good police interaction when you give the, the appropriate response to what's given to you. So if I'm telling the bus stop, the appropriate response is not to ask me why I'm standing there. Because why else would I be standing at a bus stop? And that's not even that. That's not your right as a police officer to ask me that. Even if I was walking to a white neighborhood, you do not have by law, because that's just stereotype and suspicion. You don't have a law to question me. You just could get away with it, so you do it. My other thing was, I appreciate everybody talking about how you have conversations with the police and things like that. And the thing is, of course, every police officer is not bad. So if you sit in a room with this man or this woman and you have an hour conversation, of course we want to link up. But they get a call on that radio and say, do a sweep of that girl's neighborhood. You're going to have to still do a sweep of my neighborhood regardless of how good our interaction was. So like the man said earlier, there was a former gang member and police officer. I don't know how you pulled that out. But he's like, <laughs> So, you know, I ain't gonna go that though. That's great.
do, do, do you want to close with a quick uh, Yeah, I'm going to close right now. So, <laughs> so, so we can't have conversations unless the conversation is how can we change your job description because it's the job description that criminalizes us. It's the job description that has them doing all that systematic oppression and it's also the people themselves. But how the conversation with police officers is not going to change what, what the laws that they have to enforce and if the laws are messed up. So, Carla, would you mind just addressing that? Anybody else who wants to jump in? And, and before you do, I just want to say that there is a microphone down here between, um, next to this camera. Um, there's, is, we no, take, I have this okay. one. Oh, yeah, no, rubbing the microphone here. And so, um, feel free to raise your hands and we'll uh, begin doing this conversation out. We've got a hand back up there. But yeah, on the, on the point that she made, a couple points that she made, around job description, and in some respects around, you know, in an adult-adolescent or adult-child relationship, act like the adults in that relationship. I right? think one, one true test, if you were to look at all Chicago public high schools, each of them has at least two police officers embedded in them. And you can see the different ways that young people interact with, approach, um, avoid the police officers in these schools. So this is almost an experiment to look across the different types of schools, if they're selective, magnet schools, neighborhood schools, in particular areas, and that's what I do in my research. And for many young people, as I'm walking down the hall, like, okay, parental consent to do the interview with me, they're excited to sort of show, like, oh, people care about what I think, people, you know, really want to hear what I say, and I'm like, yes, this is an important moment. So they're like, yeah, I hate the police, I hate this. But as we're, you know, walking back, and I'm walking them out of the, um, to the, back to the homeroom, it's like, hey, what's up, Officer Flores? Let me borrow a dollar. Um, Officer Smith, and I'm just like, I thought you hated the police. We have to talk some more. So they really can have an individual relationship in a positive way, and it's like within the structure of this institution. But it can also be seen as an occupying force in the same type of institution. So for one school, on the outside it says, Chicago Public Schools, children first. And then the next sign says, first you must be searched. You know, so they are creating these, contradi I mean, these contradictions each and every day. So I think the interaction can start from where we already have the kind of presence of police. Um, you said bring them, the program brings them into the precinct, but I, I still, I think that's a bit problematic too, because who's coming into the precinct? Is there a great distribution of young people, all races, classes doing this work, or is it just falling on the burden of young people from particular neighborhoods who look a certain way? But if we look across any of these institutions like schools where you have this equal presence and very different uh, behaviors and interactions, that's where you think, okay, we can change the, not only the policies, but the behaviors as well as the results. But mm -hmm. Carla, what you're saying is that, that there may be all sorts of good things happening at an individual level, but you have to change the institution. You've been studying two institutions. So how do you structurally change the so I think what um, Tracy said on the other panel, you start from the ground up, not just from the top down. You see that there is incorporation of everyone's experiences embedded into the actual policies and the practices, not just the policies, but the practices, because what the commenter um, said out there, you know, we know the law, but do people actually um, enforce the law in a way that is consistent, in a way that people can um, believe is legitimate. So I think we really do have to make sure that the legal practices and the actual uh, laws actually, you know, mesh. And that's been a problem. JT, did you want to turn? I want to I want to back here. I want to piggyback on what you were talking about about the, uh, about the uh, Chicago Police Department actually in school. I went to High Park uh, Free Academy when I was young, younger. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and, and, and there are two police officers there, and I've, and I've actually had good encounters with these police officers. I had a bad encounter with them when I first met them, just because they were police officers, and then once the relationship closed, it became something better than that. I was actually stopped by one of these police officers on my return trip back to Chicago when I was in Marine. And that officer knew me, right off the bat, he knew my face, and I did do a traffic violation. He, he handled himself as an officer to do, to, to uh, write me my ticket 
and to get my information like he was supposed to. But it was done in a different type of way. It wasn't done in, 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 a, in a controversial way where, where, where this guy's coming at me, banging on one of the next day, telling me for my license and registration. No, he instantly saw all of it. Oh man, I don't remember when he was a little knucklehead kid running around here with all the girls, you know, all this other crazy stuff. Man. And it went from that to him saying, but I have to give you this ticket because it did have a traffic violation. And he handled himself like police officers should handle themselves. So I had to disagree with what she was saying about the conversation and the relationship that, that, that doesn't matter because at that point, I've had, had, I, I've had multiple incidents, incidents with police officers throughout my life. And that was probably one of the best ones, best outcomes that could come from that because of that personal relationship that I had with them. It wasn't a deep personal relationship as in this guy knew my first name or last name. He just knew me by face and knew what type of kid I was and knew that I wasn't one of the kids that, 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 that were gang bangers. And he saw that and treated me with that same respect that he would have never felt. Really quickly, Michelle, before I go back. Yeah, I've got a slow one here, Virginia. Okay, for those of you that don't know, I represent kids accused of crime. Uh, from misdemeanors all the way up to first degree murder. So let me say this, the conversation will be incomplete unless we talk about how police treat kids accused of crime and kids who are uh, rightly so, who did exactly what the police said they did. Because as long as we are going to carve out an exception, that exception tends to swallow up everything else and leads to sort of uh, excuses that in the split moment, how do I know whether this kid's a murderer or whether he's a good kid? How am I supposed to be able to figure that out at 12 o'clock at night? Well, treat them both the same. Get the one to the station, let the other one go home, and we might also, that would be a better intervention. Most kids who commit crimes, again, are still going to be back out here. They will still need the socialization. They will still need protection. They will need to be taught how to be adults. But we cannot carve out this, you know, everybody's a gang banger, but my friends. Yeah, yeah. No. Well, tease this out just a little bit, though, because um, some people may have heard what you said, and, and the question in their mind may be, wait, 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 are you saying equate? Um, and then how do you equate the treatment of, say, someone like um, Jamel with someone who just, you know, committed a homicide? Right? So, so what do you tell us what that looks like? What I'm saying is what we're doing now is we're equating Jamel as if he just shot somebody. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just saying if you can't figure out the difference, then flip it. Treat the killer like you did. And then we'll, we'll, we'll know what to do with him once we get into the it should be more nuanced than that. Innocent but, can't prove the guilty, right? Yeah, that's, that, I, I was just going to say. There would be that. It seems to be the other way around. But how it's, how it's teased, and how you tease it out again is that everyone on that street corner may or may not be in love. Everyone in that child's home may not be a collaborator. The fact that you want to take my child out to the police station does not translate into telling me to sit my black ass down. That's what I'm talking about. That's the difference. Mom, your kids go to the station. You may, not only may, you should come with him. Not all the, you know, he'll be here, he'll be there five hours later, he's somewhere else. So I'm saying that we respect lots of people who commit crimes. Trust me, Bernie Madoff did not feel disrespect. I'm sorry. Exactly, exactly. And it's the same conduct. And, you know, at the uh, charter school in Woodlawn, not only is it criminal, it's felonious if they choose to make it so. Great points. Um, we have a question. In negative encounters with police cause a form of mental illness, anxiety, and depression, and should we begin looking at that? It may not happen right away, but years later, where uh, people who have had negative encounters with police uh, become very anxious, very depressed, very angry about what happened. 
I'm sorry, the beginning part of that, I didn't quite hear you. Could you? Yeah. Does a negative encounter with the police oh. cause okay. a form of mental illness, okay. anxiety, and depression uh, later on in life, maybe immediately? You're sort of changing your lifestyle after you run into a ne uh, negative encounter with police. You might, you're doing something different mm -hmm. not to encounter them. And should, is this is something that we should really begin also addressing too? I think that's a really good question. And what I, how I would answer you would be to say, number one, sometimes we talk about the black community as if everyone is the same. And there is a lot of variability within the community. And what I would say to you, number one, is that all humans are vulnerable, even though they'd like to equate vulnerability with risk, it is not the same. All humans are vulnerable. You know, we have both risk factors and challenges, but we also have protective factors. They within the same family, you know, given just basic differences in temperament, that people respond differently to threat, to traumatic experiences. And in terms of, you were asking about the mental health impact, you know, there are differences also in terms of how you perceive and experience supports. So you can have two uh, fellows in the, same in the same family, and one may end up, you know, here you see the law school, and one might end up on death row someplace, but yet theoretically they have the same parents, they grew up in the under the same socialization experiences, uh, they may have had the same adverse traumatic potentially, uh, experiences with uh, with police officers, but their difference is how they respond. So the whole family is involved because, to the extent that uh, families have enough support themselves, like you know jobs with good health care and good you know family support, etc., they can basically understand if something happens to one, two brothers are together, right? Because I've done this. I have a study like this. That I call it the brothers study, and these two brothers are on different developmental trajectories. Uh, and but yet they were raised in the same family. So we interviewed the brothers, then we interviewed the parents to hear what messages the parents actually gave the fellas as they were growing up. And then we asked the brothers what each actually heard. They hear very different things. And so you have to have, in essence, you know, enough support so parents can also provide the supports that are necessary, serve that wedge role with other socializing places like the school, because this baseline, there are differences in how one responds to chronic, traumatic situations. One may be able to infer a lot of support, and they can sort of walk through this high, this high risk environment and high traumatic conditions, and you get different outcomes. Another one may look like, like the young lady talked about her uncle, who looked like he shouldn't have any problems. But he might still have problems, because I would say there's also a downside of privilege. You can have a lot of supports, a lot of privileges, such that you don't learn how to cope. So when something huge and traumatic happens to you, you know, your adverse reaction is much more significant than someone else's because you've not had a history of learning how to cope and practicing coping. So what I'm saying to you in response is that one can't give just a, an answer to something like that. There are lots of individual differences, even within the same family, uh, the same gender brothers. You make meaning in different ways. You know, and that's the thing about, the, the uh, for me, the sort of, um, the contradiction here in terms of our expectations in schools. You use your intellectual prowess to perform well on all these tests. Well, you use the same intellectual prowess to make sense of your social world. And that includes the expertise, uh, or lack thereof, relationally speaking, of uh, people like police officers, people like parents even, you know, that you infer may like one brother the better, and therefore that brother may infer things differently. And it's natural, not naturally, it's unnaturally, experience trauma a little bit differently. So what I would say is that we talk about communities as if they're all the same terms of members. And too often, that's how police officers respond to young people. But in fact, there are significant differences in our jobs because of our status, i.e. police officers, teachers, or whatever. Our job is to be experienced as supportive because all support is not experienced as supportive. So the training matters in terms of relationally how we treat young people because even in schools, 
You're not, and then police officers, you're not going to embrace someone that you're fundamentally fearful of. So in, the, uh, in that previous session, the gentleman was trying to make the point about a philosophy, an undergirding philosophy of fearing all dark bodies is a real issue. Because when you have an encounter as a police officer or a teacher trying to do your job, and you suddenly view uh, that early maturing 14-year-old boy not as a, a fella in school trying to take advantage of a learning opportunity or an adolescent trying to navigate a community to have his or her needs met, you're viewed as a dangerous, as a dangerous man. And that means that it's a very different reaction, a very different coping experience, and has implications for the individual in ways that may well be different from one's own brother. Much more complex. Can I ask you to hold and get you on the next go around here? I want to get to more questions. We've got one here. Um, let's see. Oh, there's three back there. All right. We'll do one back there, down here, then we'll go back up there. All right. Yes. Hi. I, um, I just had a question. Watch well, you stand, too, if you don't the, I know there are a couple of people, at least on this panel, who are child welfare scholars. And I'm just thinking, uh, today we've talked a lot about how street interactions between police and, and youth in the street and in schools go, like, evolve or happen, but I'm um, thinking about how child welfare kind of goes into families' homes and polices people's parenting, and I don't often hear that as part of the conversation about how youth get involved in, in juvenile justice and in the prison system, but I was just wondering if, if any of you have thoughts on that and about maybe this, the silence around, around child welfare and its role in this problem. Who would like to take that? That's a whole other conversation. Um, <laughs> Emily, do you want to jump in here, Michelle? You look like you're geared up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would think that, you, no, we're not talking about the child welfare system. And policing the child welfare system <laughs> is a, it's it, an interesting way to put it. Uh, because we don't sort of police the child welfare system. If you're talking about how do children get into the juvenile justice system and the uh, adult criminal justice system, uh, again, it's any number of ways they get in there. You know, I think that um, sometimes it, it, but it is it is a sort of group failing. It's been my experience over the last 20 years that the the home may in fact have. A, debilitating factors, but the school doesn't compensate that somewhere because the resiliency has come, I think, from finding some place where one can compensate. Right. And my clients, my clients who have committed crimes and who are the most sort of traumatized and or fractured are the ones that there was not a support system, there was not, my mother didn't come home, but uh, Auntie Emma filled it, or I could go to school, or I could even go to the police station or whatever. So I mean, the feeders to the juvenile justice system and prison primarily are poverty, neglect, lack of education, and then that other sort of who knows what that says somehow this particular young adult absolutely feels isolated, abandoned, and has no I think we're probably called a positive trajectory in mind. And then it's just a matter of being out in the street day and night. Something's bound to happen. Well, I, I do a little disagree a little. Mm -hmm. How about that? <laughs> but just to say that I actually think it's it's a real insight and it sort of expands our conversation. We talk about what you mean by policing. And I, and I see more of a parallel. I mean, I think the intervention of the child welfare system in the lives, you know. Sometimes it's essential and it's life-saving, but the orientation of the child welfare system is not unlike the kind of discussion, descriptions we've heard in terms of the orientation on the streets between the young people and, and the police. I think it's a, a similar parallel story of starting with distrust and looking for the equivalent of the crime, looking for the failing parent rather than a system that looks, about, looks at relationships and, um, and have help. So we agree again. No. So just um, I have a question. I'll have you go ahead and stand up and make sure that microphone's on. Well, um, like, 
when you, I was trying to go back to what you said earlier, you said if you ain't got a corner your plate, something like that. Well, I hang with a lot of dudes, and like, I'm not a game, I'm not a game or nothing, but all my friends, like, say game to game. But I hang on with them a lot. But it's more like, when I hang with them, we just hang for fun. The police always pull up and try to mess with us. And then they usually come out to me first for some reason. But I know we're not the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but then, like, one day, me and my brother was, like, running home. And then the police just stopped us. And the first thing he said was, the y'all just got down robbing somebody. And he said it like, like it was funny, like it was really funny, like you actually thought. And I was like, really, like this, like this guy even thought I robbed somebody, he was checking my pockets. But it wasn't really hitting me because I wanted to get home and find control about my mom. I think I'm more scared of my mom than when the police went to found my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just me, like, damn, mom. And, well, the first thing that came to my mind when the police did a U turn was I saw my brother, like, we should just run and get home because they wanted to you know, find out. But then, like, I always get running to the police, like, all the time. Like, if I'm outside, I always get running about myself and my sister or something. But when I'm about myself, I'm home and, like, I want the police to be around. But at the same time, I don't. And it just feel like when the police are around, I'm about myself and, like, I just feel, like, 5% safer. But it's really at zero, but I feel like 5% safer. But at the same time, I feel like this is going to mess with me even more than if I'm about myself. I'm going to be easy target since I don't want to do nothing. And then, and then you talk about, we, have, like, we, we grow up so fast. Like for me, personally, I, I, I have to grow up fast because my family situation, then it's the same like, Pokemon show, show me no respect. I'm like, I feel like I don't have to show no respect because I, I think, because I have grown up so fast and since I'm still young, I feel like I should respect no matter what. And I don't care how old you are, like you don't respect me, well, my sister respects you. And that's how I feel. You might not that way, but it's just how I feel. No, no, let me be perfectly clear. I mean, the one thing that I certainly agree with Professor Buster's about, I think that every human being deserves respect. And I think that every young person out here deserves respect. But I think that as a parent and as an adult, the genuine respect I show you is by telling you that you need to think about this that you and I are not equal yet. I will respect you, but I owe it to you to let you know, no matter how fast you grow up, you grew up, you gotta grow up some more. And that's why adults are here to guide you along that path. I'm not, I don't think I respect teenagers by telling them, you and me, we're gonna sit around and kick it like we're equal, because it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> and you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be running home from scaring your mama to the police if you didn't know that somewhere. Um, I want to be sensitive to time. We're coming close to 5.30. I want to get to as many folks as possible. So um, I'll attempt to do that. I would just ask in return that for those who are remaining, make your question or comment um, as succinct as possible so we can try and get more voices in. Yes? Um, I would like to say that you know, you have talked about good interaction, bad interaction, but at the same time, I went to, the whole time I was sitting here, I was thinking about how many students are in there, how many kids are in there, how many, like, less adults and, like, police officers are actually sitting in these empty chairs right now. They don't seem to care to be here to listen to you, so they can hear your end on how these children feel about being pulled over, stopped, and, like, unlawfully searched. Illegally, truly, because some of them are day. My brother was actually at the age, and like he was like 13, he got pulled over just because he fit the description of someone who committed a crime of kidnapping. He asked, like, my brother had a smart mouth, he was like, What do I have to get in my pocket? And like, they were about to take the jail. Like, he was outside of my house, and it's just like the silly thing that cops do is like it develops a sense of non respect for an adult because they are an adult figure because they choose to do it. Like unlawful things like that. Like he's a 13 year old kid, he's accused of kidnapping. You see the other kids around him, and yet you sense, you think it's sensible that he's the one who committed the crime. People nowadays, they have to think. And it has to start with the ones that are ahead of the police departments that are showing these officers the ways that, of the way, the way that they learn how you go about getting through your day and how you go about how you confront these kids nowadays. Like, you can't, you have to be strong and you have to be, you have to see yourself as an alpha towards these kids so they can respect you. I take a law class with a uh, host detective. Like, he used to be a detective. And he tells us, like, 
Other he marks on the detective views the ruthless way and aggression and the thing, the strategy of fear. And he said that never worked. Being a good police officer and talking to them and getting them to feel comfortable around you will get things done. He said those who use force and use like their power against them never ever got a case done. He was like they wrecked it and when they did, it was like unlawfully and they always had problems. And you know, you guys have taking your time out to explain. And like, I find it very disrespectful that there's no Chicago police officers that are taking their time out to listen to you to fix the problem also. Um, we may, uh, tomorrow I know the conversation will put in the morning to get a perspective from police and law enforcement um, about how they view these same interactions, which I think will be really instructive and, and worthwhile for so let's take two more questions here. We got one here, and then um, yeah. Just one quick comment. Um, I am still hung up with whether the problem really is between the way police are trained and the whole idea of policing a community and racism. How much is racism, and how much is it the way the police are? I'm constantly making comparisons to the way police behave in our neighborhood and behave in other neighborhoods. Uh, police, when they approach a, a person, should treat them like they're somebody in their family. And I think if they kind of come from that, if they, if they have enough within themselves that they can identify with the person, I guess it's their humanity, that they can treat them like they were somebody. How would you like to be treated? If, if you were being approached, we all know that adolescence, as a parent I can say this, adolescence is a form of mental illness. <laughs> okay. No. Ad no. Oh, no. I want to let but but with, but what I'm what I'm seeing is that in racism, yeah. I don't you always that. see you always see black children as being a little older than they are. You never see them as being children. And when was the last time you seen the media portray an angel as a black child? They're always little white cherries. So we have to let our children have their childhood. And the police have to do unto others as they would like done unto them. Come to the out here. Um, I say one thing. Yes, I'll be to Oh, Miss King, thank you so much for that comment. But I can't let people leave like this to, you know, infer that, you know, adolescents, you know, represent a form of mental illness. I just want to say two things. There are two points in the life course where maturation is off the chart. Where, in essence, biologically determined maturation is off the chart. And those are also the two points in the life course where we demonize the individuals at that point. One is adolescence, and the other is the turtle twos. So the point here is that it's not that they are showing a form of mental illness. They are showing all the attributes that we want them to show academically, for example. Because, you know, how they are, their health, et cetera, determines this is what they say in their ability to analyze. So they're fine, but we have to respect where they are as well. I know, <laughs> but I take it seriously because so, I love adolescents. Um, I want to go to the other point, though, here, because I think, I mean, there's a, a, a very, very central question. We can do a lot of training. There can be great relationships, individual to individual. But if we are living in a culture and a society um, with media images that demonize, in particular, young black males, how do we escape that? I'm curious to know what your, what your sense is. Does, does that just overwhelm everything? I think the, the sort of guiding structure of policing is to look for the people who are deemed criminal. And so this sort of stereotype of who is criminal, what the criminal looks like, where does, does the criminal live, all of this guides the sort of policing decisions. And I'm hoping we'll hear more nuance about this tomorrow. I mean, there's a lot of social psychological research about how you know, they make decisions about who to shoot and when they see a weapon. And we're seeing this with Walter Scott, with Eric Harris, with these more recent really violent and fatal encounters. And it's a lot about the sort of mentality of um, police officers. But I think there is a guiding construct of um, the racialization 
and the criminalization of particular neighborhoods and particular types of people that we do have to deal with. And that is embedded within a larger policing culture. It's also embedded within um, us as communities and how we think about who the other is. So I think we have to not be so idealistic to say, oh, they, should, they will see us as equals, because there is a power relationship, there is a vulnerability, there is a selection to when police are called to particular places for a homicide, or for a robbery, or for this. This is not, this data, they don't get the kind of nice swath of variation. They're getting the worst of the worst in some ways, and this is what's forming their assessment of who people are. It's not random, it's not you know, well distributed, and that's what they're working with. Sure, let, me let, let me just say this. I think at you know, the end of the day, we get the police force that we deserve. Um, and we don't import police from other countries. We don't import them from other planets. They're our brothers, our sisters, our husbands, our wives. If they're racist, guess what? You know, they reflect us as much as they inform us. So yes, race, if we are not willing to talk about racism, sexism, poverty, and homophobia, we're not really going to be able to talk about anything realistically in this country. Uh, because we're on time, I know many people have other questions and comments. We have a reception coming up that I would invite everybody to participate in, and you can continue this conversation with our panelists. I want to um, leave with, with, with Jamal having the last word here. Um, and tomorrow we're going to hear from police. I'm curious to know, what would you like to hear from law enforcement tomorrow? If you were to, just to understand. Well, the one thing I would like to hear from law, law enforcement is that, that the actual statistics of, you know, of, of how many black males get stopped uh, compared to, you know, in, in this typical area, because I, honestly, I don't know. Uh, you have the UCPD, and then you have the, the you know, CPD, but the UCPD doesn't disclose that type of information. But it will be nice to know the statistics so we can actually get some root things issues and say that this is a problem. That, uh, that I want to hear how the better the police department compared to how they're just reacting to all of the media fire that's been happening for us. It, it's not about the and everybody knows yeah. this about the Mongol jungle, but when it comes down to community members, I want to hear how they are interacting with the community tonight and, and how that and how that is going to further the relationship between police and the community. Not just the youth, but just the community in general. Because it's a bit disconnect. They do come from our communities. But once they when once they leave that community, it becomes a whole different ballgame. And I have the same culture shock when I went to the Marine Corps. Going into the Marine Corps, you have the, you have normal people like me coming out of high school and then going to the Marine Corps. And then it's a it's a huge culture shock when you go to another country and people treat you like you're the devil. And then you, and then when I came back to, to Chicago, I saw the same I had the same exact culture shock because it's like the people that I was protecting all those years seem not to be doing the, the things that I was trying to uphold in another country. But then it's the uh, the police department. I want to hear how they're better than the folks in Park Lane instead of how they're just reacting to the media fire. I, I don't care about the media fire. All I care about is the community, the people in the community. Uh, you're more likely to get shot in the south side of Chicago than the north side of Chicago. I know that. I, I've lived there. I've been from one end to the other on the bicycle with my kids. They, they know. They know you're more likely to get shot down here than up there. It, it, the, sir, the more south you go in Chicago, the worse the police department gets. And, and, and that's by design because the reality is there are bad people in our communities. People who are, we keep saying that they're not, but they are. And the police, they do respond to those bad people. And they're, necessary, and they're necessary to respond to those bad people. But the thing is, good people have to get behind the police, and the police have to get with the good people. Because if they don't, the bad people are going to win, corporations are going to get bigger, everybody's going to get funded, but the good people are the community. If the community's not funded, and supported by the police department and the people in the community, then, then what are we really here talking about? Well, JT, we'll have an opportunity to hear from the perspective of police tomorrow. That panel begins at 9 a.m. back here. The reception I mentioned is just down the hallway now. We encourage you to continue the conversation with each other with our panelists. But in the meantime, please join me in thanking you. Know,
Margaret Beale Spencer, Emily Boss, Michelle Conyers, and Carl Shev. Thank you all so much for